You are my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. What? Did we just say that last week and talk about that? Remember last week we heard about the disciples and Jesus going up a high mountain and the transfiguration occurred. And we heard God's voice say, you are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Today, it goes a step further. We see Jesus once again getting baptized and then out in the wilderness. That baptism, another covenant, another contract that we all share from our baptisms with Jesus as we are accepted as children of God. And then in the first Peter reading, we are reminded that Christ's suffering is salvation. It has a salvation function, but it's also a paradigm shift. Paul writes and says, the act of suffering is the act of doing right. Because believers will understand that as Christians, we will suffer. There's that expectation. And we suffer because we live in a world that lives at odds with us. And then in the Old Testament lesson, we have the familiar story of Noah and the promise of a great flood never happening again. These three scripture readings seem very disjointed with very little in common. But there is. The common theme is the idea of contracts or covenants. So let's talk about that. How do covenants, contracts work? And you'll hear me use them interchangeably. Well, in the first century, theologians believed that when two parties wanted to create a contract, they would go outside the city gates. The elders of the city would sit at the gate and kind of like what we might do in the 21st century of coming before the Supreme Court, the two parties will stand before the elders and present their case. And it's not that the elders decided who got what. The elders kind of moderated that discussion. And the two parties would accept each other's deal with a handshake. Nothing written down. Just a simple handshake. A lot of times, these covenants were for land, property, possibly sheep or goats, money, plus a multitude of other other ideas and um, needs to come before the elders to create that that commitment. And all these covenants were raised with the intention of fidelity, of mutuality, and of obedience to the contract that's made. What's wonderful about contracts and covenants is that it allows us to see something in paper or have that mutual agreement, and then we can move forward in faith knowing that what's taken place is secure, settled, and we can move forward in faith. One of those contracts that were quite often um, implemented during the ancient times is the notion of the Jubilee year. If you took a loan from your neighbor and you'd paid it faithfully for six years, 
but you still had a balance. On the seventh year, it was forgiven. And that was so that people could move forward in life without that burden upon themselves. And that there would be no bitterness or anger that would rise and bubble up as a result of a lengthy contract. So we come back to the story of Noah and the ark. We know that Noah stepped out in faith to build this ark. He followed God's instructions. The great flood happened. He had an ark full of animals. The ark lands. The doves go out. The waters have receded. And here we are. God is having a conversation with Noah. And if we look at this encounter, we can see that it's different. There's no mutuality. It's just God talking. God is engaging in a, uni- in a unilateral conversation. He is engaging with Noah, which also indicates his resolve. And the words that indicate that are, as for me, so there is the first person and the intentionality behind this agreement that God is going to give to Noah. At the same time, in announcing his intentions, it is an act of graciousness, an act of self-giving by a giving God. So this is where I love the fact that the Bible is a living word. I've read the story, as you may have too, many, many times. And this week, the light bulb went on. This contract is also a contract with God's creation, with the animals that were saved by them living in the ark. And God has bonded with loyalty to all of his creation. But when we look even closer to this encounter and to the words, we talk about a bow. Now, I don't know about you, but I think about a rainbow. And I imagine we all do. But the Bible doesn't say rainbow. It says bow. And in those times, what were the weapons of choice? Bows and arrows. So God has made a sign of peace from an instrument of destruction. Walter Brigham, who was an Old Testament scholar, he has since passed away, says this about the rainbows that we imagine. The bow is likely to be understood not in romantic ways, but with the accent on nor with the accent on political pluralism. Rather, it refers to God's bow and arrows as a weapon of war, hostility, and destructiveness. Thus, the bow is suspended in the sky, means that God has made a gesture of disarmament, has hung up his primary weapon, and now has no intention of being the aggressor or adversary. This is a gesture of peace and reconciliation. Brought new meaning to me when I see a rainbow. And then there are two other points that are made from the scripture that were light bulb moments for me. God says that the rainbow, the bow, is a reminder that the great flood will never happen again. God forgets, truly God forgets that he needs a rainbow to remind him. God forgets. And there's scripture to back it up, that God does forget. We see those scriptures in many Psalms and in Genesis and in Exodus. 
But not only does God forget, when he forgets, this is the second light bulb moment, God is likely to engage in negative and destructive, let's say, behavior, which is so counterintuitive to how I and maybe you see God. God who loves us and cares for us. God has to restrain himself. He has to suspend the rainbow up in the sky. He has to suspend the the bow. And in doing so, the best version of God exists. So how can all of this apply to us? What can we do? We are humans, and when we engage in self-destructive behavior and hurtful words, conversations and relationships go south. So we too need to engage in self-restraint. We too need to have that rainbow suspended up in the air as a reminder to put our own best foot forward. And when we do that, then we can walk out and trust that our encounters will be safe. We can say the truth in an environment that is utterly safe. So if God can do it, I can do it too. Amen.